Hello, everyone. Welcome back. Today, we're going to take a look at the chemical basis of life. And I know you might be thinking, why do we care about chemistry? This is a biological science class. Well, we're going to see today how a basic understanding of chemistry is necessary for us to understand how living things operate. So while biology is the study of living things, living things themselves are made up of chemical composition. Therefore, our survival is dependent on the reactions taking place inside and out of the body. So we identified last uh, class, we talked about some of the properties of living things, and one of those was metabolism and the acquisition and use of energy. That is an example of the chemical reactions that's taking place in our bodies. Our bodies are nothing more than a combination of different chemical reactions taking place. So therefore, in order to understand living things, we need to have a good understanding of chemistry. So we're gonna take a journey over the next few slides to just look at how our bodies and our, our chemical composition um, exist and understand some base, basic properties of chemistry. So we'll start talking about elements, atoms, and compounds, all right? At this point, you've definitely taken a chemistry class, so you've heard about the periodic table of elements, right? So we're going to understand a little bit more how these uh, elements that we find on the periodic table help to sustain life, right? So we're saying that organisms are composed of elements, usually combined into various compounds. So living organisms are composed of matter. So what is matter? Matter is anything that has mass and takes up space. Matter is composed of chemical elements. So those chemical elements that are found on the periodic table, about 25 of those are essential for human life. Make a note of that. And of those 25 that are considered to be essential elements, about four of those make up about 96% of the weight of most living things, all right? So at the end of this lesson today, I want you to have a great grasp on the um, chemical elements that make up the majority of the mass of living things. There are four, okay? And so these chemical elements that we're looking at today, they're typically going to be um, you're, you're typically going to find them existing as a compound. All right, we're going to define a compound as a substance that consists of two or more different elements in a fixed ratio. All right, so many of the properties of our lives, all of the things that help us to continue to exist, are basically the product of these compounds. All right, so we're going to look to see then how these chemical elements um, form compounds. And we're going to talk a little bit about chemical bonds and these forces of attraction that are going to hold these elements together. All right. So right here, just in case you're kind of fuzzy, this is an image of the periodic table of elements. All right. There are, there's an arrangement here of elements in groups and, and periods based on um, various properties of these chemical elements and their reactivity. Some of these elements are uh, naturally found in nature, but they are also uh, synthetically produced chemical elements on this uh, periodic table of elements. So we're going to see then how these elements help to uh, play a role in our lives and which ones are actually important. So I mentioned that these elements um, are a part of our lives in various capacities, particularly as compounds. One compound that you're probably all familiar with is table salt, sodium chloride, okay? This particular compound is made from the uh, pure elements, sodium and chlorine, okay? So individually, these are two completely distinct elements. They have very different properties. They have very different uh, reactivities uh, independently, one being a metal, one being a gas. However, when these two elements are combined together, we get the formation of a completely uh, different compound that we know as table salt, okay? When we look at chemical elements on the periodic table, we can identify them based on they, their uh, chemical symbol or abbreviation. So as you continue to matriculate through this course and your chemistry courses, if you're taking any, you're going to see um, and become familiar with the uh, chemical symbols of these uh, elements, all right? So the chemical symbol for sodium is Na, 
chemical symbol for chlorine is Cl. And so this newly formed compound here is sodium chloride, which is indicated by this NaCl, okay? So we've all seen or used table salt at some point in our lives. So in terms of the chemical elements that are essential for life, as I said, about 25 of them are gonna be considered essential elements um, for our sustaining life, but they, they're gonna exist in different uh, percentages. We're gonna find them in our bodies across different percentages. And so this illustration right here shows us the elements of the human body um, as a percentage of body weight, all right? So our take home here is that yes, there are many of them that are essential for life, but there are about four that makes up over the majority of our mass, okay? We're saying that about four chemical elements make up about 96% of our body weight, okay? Those four elements, uh, you should jot these down, are carbon, hydrogen, oxygen, nitrogen, okay? Ma majority of the mass, about 96% of the mass of living things are gonna be mostly made up of these four chemical elements. And this illustration just kind of shows you again, not based on anatomical location, that's not what this represents, but it does sort of show you uh, just a visual in terms of the percentage of body weight, how much of these elements our bodies contain. So our bodies are mostly made up of this oxygen right here, okay? Our bodies are about 65% oxygen, okay? Next, we have carbon, okay? Our bodies are made of about 18.5% carbon, uh, hydrogen, 9.5% oxygen, almost 10% of our bodies are, I'm sorry, hydrogen, okay? And then nitrogen. Nitrogen is a very important chemical element in our bodies, and it makes up about 3% of our weight, okay? So collectively, carbon, hydrogen, oxygen, and nitrogen makes up about 96% of our mass, right? We know that we require oxygen to breathe. Carbon, as we know, is about the foundation or backbone of all organic molecules, the foods that we eat and so forth. It's hydrogen, we know this is a major element. It makes up the molecule water. We know that our bodies are um, mostly made up of water. So these hydrogen uh, molecules are quite important. When you think about the water, our organs, lubrication and so forth, the, that hydrogen becomes very, very important. Um, nitrogen is an important uh, component when we think about proteins in our bodies and amino acids being the building blocks of proteins and how our cells actually function. These nitrogen um, compound or elements and compounds are going to be um, important. All right. And so then what about these others? Because we said that there are about 25 that we consider to be uh, essential for life. While they are essential for life, they're not found in the same um, percentage or abundance, all right? And so we refer to those elements as trace elements, all right? Trace elements are the chemical elements that are necessary for sustaining life in some way or in, uh, in terms of um, existence or keeping us healthy and so forth. And so these elements... Uh, trace elements can be found in smaller, more minute amounts for varying, varying reasons, okay? And so we're saying that trace elements are common additives to our food and water that provide some type of um, benefit for us, okay? So some trace elements are required to prevent disease. For example, fluoride, all right? Although there's controversy on this practice, fluoride is usually added to municipal water and dental products in order to help reduce uh, tooth decay, all right? So you've probably all heard of this element before, all right? Uh, in addition, there are other ways in which we can uh, obtain these trace elements as they are added to our foods for varying reasons, to help preserve it, to make it more nutritious, uh, to make it look better. So you've heard about, you know, your foods being fortified with various um, substances. And so that can also be the case with some trace elements in order to provide, again, some additional nutrition, nu nutrients that our bodies need um, 
to uh, help pre prevent disease, um, to help serve as a preservative. We may use these chemical elements. So a number of things. And so, and so the, the, goal, the point that we're making here is that we could not exist absent chemistry, all right? Chemical properties, chemical compositions. These chemicals are, these chemical elements are a uh, very important addition to our lives, okay? And so these chemical elements are made up of atoms, all right? Atoms consist of protons, neutrons, and electrons. All right, so we're saying here that each element that is found on the periodic table of elements consists of one kind of atom. Compounds are formed when we have atoms of different elements interacting together. So an atom, by definition, is the smallest unit of matter that still retains the property of an element. So each atom is very specific to an element. So the three subatomic particles are relevant to our discussion of elements. And so if we were to look at the, uh, uh, of an illustration of the structure of the atom, we're going to find that there are subatomic particles distributed within the nucleus of the atom and in these outer uh, valence shells. Okay. And so the three subatomic particles here that we're talking about, again, are protons, neutrons, and electrons. Structurally, the neutrons and protons are going to be packed into an atom's nucleus, okay? And then we have electrons that are going to orbit the outside of the nucleus in these outer energy shells, okay? So when we're looking at an element and trying to identify an element, every element on the periodic table has a unique identifier in their atomic number, okay? The atomic number represents the number of protons in an atom. This atomic number, the number of protons, is going to be unique to an individual element. Every element on the periodic table has a unique atomic number, which again tells us the number of protons in the nucleus of this atom, jot that down. So when we're looking at the periodic table, no, we don't expect you to remember every element on the periodic table and the atomic number and the atomic mass. But what we do want you to understand at this level is that when we're looking at this periodic table, we already said that these elements are arranged in um, different rows and periods based on their uh, reactivity. We want you to also be able to determine some other pieces of information. We want you to be able to use the information on the periodic table. When you look at the periodic table, we identify an element of interest and we see that it has an atomic number of six. That automatically tells us something very specific, okay? We can identify an element based on its atomic number, okay? The atomic number tells us more about the atomic makeup of this element, okay? The number of protons, all right? Here we have the atomic um, subatomic particle distribution of an element, okay? This particular element, we can see here that our illustration shows us that we have an atom, okay? Within the nucleus of the atom, we've got protons and neutrons, okay? These subatomic particles also have an electrical charge, okay? Protons are gonna be positively charged here in the pink, Neutrons are going to be neutral or have no charge. And then we have our negatively charged electrons, okay? Electrons, again, are going to orbit the nucleus of these atoms, okay? And what we have found out is that it is the presence of these electrons that are going to uh, determine reactive properties of these uh, atoms, okay? So... Protons and neutrons are found in the nucleus. Electrons are found out in orbit in those outer uh, valence shells. So we're clear here that atoms consist of subatomic particles that we call protons, neutrons, and electrons, okay? So we mentioned the atomic number, 
being the number of protons in the nucleus. Now we also have some information that we know as the atomic mass. The atomic mass is the sum of the number of protons and neutrons in the nucleus, okay? So this tells us some more information about this atom. The atomic mass is approximately equal to its mass number. So again, if we're looking at this uh, periodic table of elements, using the periodic table, we can um, obtain some more information about this element, the atomic mass, all right? This is gonna be the number on the periodic table. It's typically gonna be a number that contains a decimal, okay? If we're looking at that atomic number, that's usually gonna be a whole number that represents the total number of protons in this atom. The atomic mass can contain a decimal. That's one way that you might be able to quickly identify this number depending on the type of periodic table that you're looking at. So we said that these chemical elements typically exist as compounds. So how do these compounds form? Compounds are formed via chemical bonds. What are chemical bonds? Chemical bonds are forces of attraction. Okay, these chemical bonds are going to facilitate the uh, attraction or uh, between atoms of different elements in order for compounds to be formed. So, as I mentioned earlier, the distribution of electrons, okay, in those outer energy shells that are in orbit around the, the, atom, uh, the, the, the atom's nucleus those electrons are gonna determine an atom's chemical properties. So these electrons that we're talking about here are located in electron shells, okay? Each with a very characteristic distance from the nucleus. And so an atom whose outer electron shell is not full, okay, where you've got single electrons present, they tend to interact with atoms of other elements. And these interactions can be in the form of sharing, gaining, or losing electrons, resulting in these attractions that we call chemical bonds. So we're gonna look at some different types of chemical bonds that exist, okay? Chemical bonds can be formed again due to the sharing of electrons, or uh, due to the gain or loss of electrons, all right? This image right here represents the electron distribution of the first 18 elements in the periodic table, okay? All of these elements are gonna have different uh, arrangements of electrons in these outer energy shells, okay? Some are gonna have full valences and some will not. Depending on the arrangement and distribution of, it, of these electrons, they are going to dictate various properties of the elements of the elements of these atoms of these elements and how they interact with atoms of other elements, okay? Be it the sharing, gaining, or loss of electrons. So covalent bonds, okay? Covalent bonds are created when atoms of different elements share electrons, okay? We can have nonpolar covalent bonds and then we can have polar covalent bonds, okay? We see polar covalent bonds in the water molecule, okay? Nonpolar covalent bonds, the electrons are shared equally. So formation of a covalent bond here can be seen as two hydrogen atoms approach, okay? The electron of each of these atoms is also attracted to the proton in the other nucleus, okay? So what's happening is that these two electrons become shared, 
in a covalent bond with each atom gaining a complete uh, valence shell. This is an example of a covalent bond. I would like for you to be able to uh, have a general understanding of types of bond formations, okay? So covalent bonds are created due to uh, the sharing of electrons between atoms of different elements, okay? Here are some common uh, molecules, hydrogen, oxygen, methane, which is a gas, and water. We can see the respective electron distribution diagram here. We've got the electron sharing right here where we've got covalent bonding taking place due to uh, these electrons in both of the outer energy shells being shared here, creating a full valence on both, okay? Whereas we can continue to see some uh, other uh, electron distributions in oxygen, O2, we've got respective electron uh, arrangements here in each of these outer energy shells as well as methane and water, okay? We also show you some of the structural formula and the space filling model of how we can represent these four molecules, okay? The molecular formula for, for hydrogen is H2, oxygen is O2, methane, CH4, very common molecule, and of course, water. You've seen this molecular formula for water, okay? These molecules, interact and form the, the, these compounds can be made and we said that the by definition we define the compound as um, interactions of elements atoms of different elements in uh, fixed ratios so if we looked at water for example this molecular formula is h2o there's a fixed ratio of hydrogen to oxygen atoms in this molecule so another type of bond, another type of chemical bond is the ionic bond, okay? Ionic bonds are attractions between ions of opposite charges. So then what are ions? An ion is an atom or a molecule with an electrical charge resulting from the gain or loss of electron, okay? So if this atom has a charge, now it's an ion. All right, so two ions with opposite charges are going to attract, okay? When the attraction, when the attraction that holds these ions together is called an ionic bond. So ionic bond is created when you've got two ions of different charges attracting. I showed you the example of table salt earlier as a very common compound created between two different elements. Table salt. <laughs> salt is a synonym for an ionic bond. This is where we have a negative ion and a positive ion interacting together via this ionic bonding. So as a checkpoint question in your notes now, scroll back over and explain what holds together the ions in a crystal of table salt. How does this crystal of table salt exist? An illustration here of our point we're making with that table salt being created. Sodium, as well as chlorine, has a predetermined number of electrons in these outer energy shells that are in orbit around this nucleus, okay? There's going to be a donation of electrons from sodium to chlorine to help fill this valence here, okay? Sodium chloride is formed due to the donation of this electron from sodium to chlorine. This gain of electron for chlorine turns it now into a chloride ion. 
we said that an ion is formed due to the gain or loss of an electron that leads to a, an electrical charge, okay? So now we've got this positively charged sodium ion, this negatively charged chlorine ion forming this uh, sodium chloride or table salt. Let's watch this animation here of what happens during ionic bonding. Sometimes atoms can treat their outer shells by stealing or giving away electrons. This happens between sodium and chlorine atoms. An electron moves from the sodium atom to the chlorine atom. The outer shells of both atoms are now complete, containing eight electrons. The chlorine atom now has 18 electrons, but only 17 protons. Because an electron has a negative charge, the chlorine atom now has a net negative charge. Such a charged atom or molecule is called an ion, in this case, a negative ion. The sodium atom has lost an electron, leaving it with an extra proton, which has a positive charge. The sodium atom has become a positive ion. Ions with opposite charges are attracted to each other, forming an ionic bond. These ions combine to form a compound with new properties. In this case, sodium chloride, ordinary table salt, is formed. Another type of bond here that you should be familiar with is the hydrogen bonds, okay? Hydrogen bonds are weak bonds, but are very important in the chemistry of life. So one of the most important types of weak bonds is the hydrogen bond. The hydrogen atoms of a water molecule are attached to oxygen by polar covalent bonds, okay? Because of these polar bonds and the wide V shape of the molecule, water is considered to be a polar molecule, okay? So checkpoint question, what enables neighboring water molecules to hydrogen bond to one another? The hydrogen bond is a very important bond in sustaining life, all right? So we've got hydrogen bonds between water molecules and we've got polar bonds within a water molecule, okay? I'm gonna stop here. <laughs>